Washington Journal continues. Our guest joining us at our uh, C-SPAN table, William Bloom. Uh, he is the author of this book, Rogue State, A Guide to the World's Only Superpower. The book and our guest, both in the news as of uh, late, uh, due to a statement from Osama bin Laden. Uh, you may remember that it was in the latest tape that was released that uh, uh, bin Laden said that, and, and I quote here, and if Bush decides to carry on with his lies and oppression, then it would be useful, you to, for, useful for you to read the book Rogue State which states in its introduction, if I were president, I would stop the attacks on the United States. First, I would give an apology to all the widows and orphans and those who were tortured. Then I would announce that American interference in the nations of the world has ended once and for all. Mr. Bloom, what's it been like for you over the last few weeks? Very, very hectic. Uh, I haven't slept a good night yet in, in the past 10 days, but um, I'm enjoying it. Uh, tell us a little bit about the reaction you have received because of Osama bin Laden's mention of you and your work. Well, I've gotten about a thousand emails, uh, many of which are hostile, uh, a few even um, threatening. Uh, but I've also gotten plenty of support. Uh, even some old friends I hadn't seen in many years have contacted me. And I've been on a, a media whirlwind, uh, which is very new to me. I was on TV for the first time in my life, I think I was. Um, I'm looking forward to going back to my normal daily routine, actually. Why hostile? Why, why threatening emails and words? Oh, because they, they think I'm giving aid and comfort to the enemy. That's one of the main arguments, and they, uh, they're they very upset by that. Uh, but I, uh, my answer, I can give you my answer, what, what should I give to them, if you want to hear that. Go ahead. Uh, my, my answer is, on the one hand, I have nothing but intense dislike for religious fundamentalism and the kinds of society spawned by such fundamentalism, like the Taliban in Afghanistan. So that should be clear. I have total distaste for that. On the other hand, I'm a member of a movement which is committed, which has the, the, the high ambition uh, of slowing down, if not stopping, the American empire and, and hoping to cease its continuation of uh, very harmful actions all over the world, like the, the bombings and the interventions and the overthrowing governments and torture and so on. It's been going on for a long, long time. And we, we're committed to slowing that down. And, and to do that, we have to reach the American public. And to reach the American public, we have to have access to the mass media, which we normally don't. I mean, I certainly don't. And so, because of what happened, I, I have had much more access to, to the mass media than I ever imagined I would. So for that reason, I'm glad that it happened. Did you attempt to distance yourself once uh, Bin Laden's statements came out about your book and your work? I, from, from the first moment, I've kept a distance from him and his, his philosophy and his politics. But I have not uh, said that I'm, I'm sorry that it happened. For the, for the reason I just gave, I'm not sorry. So because, because it assists you in your cause? Yes, exactly. For those who are not familiar with the work, uh, could you give a synopsis of Rogue State? The first version of that book came out in the year 2000, following the American bombing of, of Yugoslavia in 1999, which we were told by the government was an act of humanitarianism. and. Uh, I was inspired uh, thusly to sit down and write this book, which is in effect a mini encyclopedia of the many kinds of unhumanitarian policies of U.S. foreign policy. And it's, it's a, a catalog of all those things. It has chapters on torture and interventions and overthrowing governments and the use of chemical and biological weapons and interference in elections. All, all the less than nice things our government has done over the, the past 60 years in its foreign policy. The quote that Osama bin Laden used specifically when he, we referenced your work, that doesn't come from this book? Well, it does. In effect, it comes from, I, I'd forgotten at first about this, it comes from the, the edition published in the UK. This came out, in t the first version came out in 2000 in the States, but in 2002, a, an English version came out in, in the UK, and that version is what was, became the Arabic uh, edition of the book, and I assume it was the Arabic edition of that version which was read by bin Laden, 
And so he was right. It, it's in that version. Your publisher is reacting to this how? He, with great uh, uh, sorrow that he, he doesn't have enough copies on hand. He had a, we, we're sold out completely. We had only a small amount anyhow. Uh, he's, we're sold out and it'll be a few weeks uh, before any, any copies are available. So I ask anyone who wants to buy a copy to please have patience. It'll be the end of February before copies are available again. What do you want to do politically with the experiences that you're getting now? What, what happens next? Well, I'm, I'm just uh, glad that it's happening now and uh, I'll be uh, dealing with, with the media and with the emails for some time yet, I guess. We have calls for you. Uh, again, if you want to uh, talk to our guest, the numbers will be on your screen as you uh, uh, we'll put them up. And you can also email us, journal at cspan.org. Your first call comes from Detroit, Michigan. Caller, go ahead. Hi. First, I want to make it clear. I am not condoning what Osama bin Laden sitting about your book and everything else. He's a mur murderer. He's a killer. He should have been caught already. He's the one that did 9-11. This administration used that to go to Iraq. And everything they do, everything, is related to terrorism. They keep scaring the American people. It's about time the Americans stood up. Do they know that in Iraq, with all those bombs that they made, there might be somebody in this house? And they start bombing these houses? Between 150 and 200,000 Iraqis are dead. Not the insurgents, but the men, women, babies, children. Collateral damage, they keep calling it. This government is scary. They want power. They want to go ahead and do whatever they want. Since they've been in there, it's been secret, secret. The energy thing, everything's a secret to them. We pay them. They come out of our tax money. They're supposed to serve us. Mr. Bloom. Yes, I was, I'm confused. I thought at first the caller was, was opposed to me, but it, the way he finished up, it sounds like he's on my side. Uh, one thought, though, I mean, he says uh, we, we, we went to Iraq because of 9-11. That, that is fallacious, I think. Uh, we're there for other reasons, like, like oil, for one. Uh, and Saddam Hussein had no connection whatsoever with 9-11 or, or, or with, uh, with Al-Qaeda. Sherman Oaks, California. Yes, um, Mr. Bloom, uh, how proud you must be that you get such a great review from, uh, from a man that the uh, Democrats admire so much, uh, Osama bin Laden. You're making money off the man, um, the perpetrator of 9-11. Uh, you get, again, you must be so proud. You and the other Democrats on the hate America left must be, uh, you know, you know that you're putting the final um, nail in the coffin of the Democratic Party, and, and for that I am grateful. And uh, have you ever worked on your list? First of all, I am not a, a Democrat at all, I mean, uh, of, of the party, so I don't know why you assume that. Secondly, th that party has not endorsed uh, bin Laden, uh, even though you say that. And thirdly, I've never used the word proud. I'm not proud of the endorsement. I'm glad of it. It's not the same thing at all. It's Newport, Rhode, uh, Rhode Island. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Bloom, I... Uh Sincerely appreciate you being on, and uh, in spite, I want to apologize for all the ignoramuses and the neocons that want to reframe the question and attack you like the prior caller. I come from an open mind. I can completely understand your philosophy, your factorial information on your book. You are trying to pose the question to people that are of an open mind to look at our policy, our terrible foreign policy of all the things that President Bush said he was going to do, and he's done the complete opposite for this country. We have increased terrorism. We've increased our enemies. And all you're trying to do, I believe, is speak out in regards to this, to stand up for our nation, for what we stand up for, not to stand against this country or this administration or anything, and that people need to have an open mind and stop their ignorance and always immediately assume that you're some kind of a liberal or a progressive or whatever, that you are just, you are more patriotic than a lot of people to come on TV and the people to see you and all the threats that you've had against you. I am so proud of you, and I hope that God and that the American people will stand up for you along with American citizens 
to stop this kind of terrible diplomacy. I can't even really use the word, and God bless you, and keep up the good work, and I really admire your strength and courage. Thank you very much. Uh, one point you mentioned, which is very important, that our, uh, our foreign policy is, in fact, creating terrorists, uh, anti-American terrorists. And this was confirmed last year by a CIA report, uh, which said exactly that. And, and that by itself is, is reason enough for us to leave Iraq. For William Bloom, Rochester, New York. Hi, Mr. Bloom. Um, I'm just waking up and catching this program. Uh, it's nice to wake up to a good discussion. Uh, I don't lean against or for you in any way, but I was curious about to hear comments that you may have on one historical fact. And I subscribe somewhat to some of the neocon philosophy and also Tom Barnett's Pentagon's new map, and that is in the absence of the Cold War keeping a lid on pressure cookers, after 1990, things have been popping up left and right where we have to keep things in check. We have to be the world's police in some way, shape, or form. Otherwise, we're dealing with mass chaos. If you went into a time machine and went back to 1900 and asked people, would there be more than 100 democratic countries, nations in the world in the year 2000, people would have been shocked and said, no way. If you would have gone to 1945 and said, how would Germany and Japan end up? And now they're two of the top two of the top five economic powers in the world. If you would have gone to 1947 when the Marshall Plan was investing in countries like Greece, and gone to 2002 where the Olympics were held with Russia taking part, I would agree with you that short term wise we are creating more terrorism. But long term strategic plans to reshape the world goes back to Wilson and. Trump. Truman, those policies and long-term strategies. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bloom. Well, the world has never asked us to be the policeman for the whole world. And I think if you took a poll right, right now amongst the, the people of the world, you would find great opposition to what, what you're just saying. In fact, the polls do show that. The, uh, major polls in the past few years in, in the Middle East and elsewhere have shown that people are not, uh, the, the, the people in the Middle East, for example, are not opposed to our uh, freedom and democracy, as we're told by the White House. They're not opposed to our culture, our music, and our, our television. They're opposed to our foreign policy. That is, that is what uh, separates them from other people. Uh, and we have to, uh, we're going to continue to create terrorists as long, as long as our foreign policy doesn't change. And being the world's policeman is not a way to change. That's the way it's been. Astoria, Oregon. Yes, good morning. Um, I was uh, um, very interested to hear and agree with everything that the, the author says about our foreign policy and, and its impact on the world. But I do have a, um, um, a defense for him that he might be able to use, and that is that um, on September the 12th, uh, Noam Chomsky has, has mentioned in many uh, talks that he predicted that um, the, that every repressive regime in this world would begin to call their uh, the rebellions of the people terrorism, and um, no one ever says anything about that, or nobody ever says, "Oh, George Bush is promoting you know terrorism around the world, or promoting these repressive regimes, or getting in bed with them, and that kind of thing." So I think that's sort of the opposite situation where you have Osama bin Laden happening to read his book and, and say something about it. But then on the other hand, you've got these repressive regimes saying, you know, we've got to fight this terrorism, which is just usually a people's rebellion. Yeah, the word terrorism today is used in the same way and, and just as loosely as the word communism was, was used during the Cold War. And I deal with that question in, in my books. Uh, it's my thesis that the, there was never, in fact, an international communist conspiracy, as we were all told. So that's a, a major lie. Uh, it compares with the, the major lie of this period that if, in fact, I, Saddam Hussein had had those uh, awful weapons, then we would have been justified to invade Iraq. But that's, that's, that's fallacious. Because what reason would he, he have had to, to attack the, the U.S.? unless he has an irresistible urge for mass national suicide. 
So uh, that's, that's, what, that's a big lie which is seldom mentioned anymore. Tallahassee, Florida. Hi, Mr. Bloom. Could you, or do you know how many Iraqi civilians have been killed by American action? And by the Iraqi civilians, I mean innocent, non-combatants. Do you have a number for that? And if so, do you know where it's published so that we can verify some of these numbers we hear? Well, one th th source which comes to mind is uh, from about a year and a half ago or so. The Lancet Medical Journal in the UK, they, they did uh, a fairly scientific survey of the um, households in Iraq and determined that what, there were over 100,000 civilians killed. And this was some time ago, so now it's much more, of course. The figure by which Bush gives out at 30,000, I'm sure is uh, far understated. Priest River, Idaho. Uh, good morning. I'd like to say thank you for taking my call and thank you for C-SPAN. I uh, uh, wanted to ask the author, uh, since Osama bin Laden did recommend his book, are there any books you would recommend, sir? Um, for example, do you read any Des Griffin or anything like that? <laughs> Des Griffin? I'm not sure what? I know that name. Uh, he wrote the book uh, Descent into Slavery. Uh, maybe not, oh. but is there any... Authors or well, any if you're speaking you about U.S. foreign policy, uh, which is my specialty, the the authors I would most recommend would be uh, Michael Parenti and uh, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman and Howard Zinn and Alexander Coburn. Uh, Minneapolis, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I wanted to ask uh, the gentleman, does he consider his politics of a Democrat or Republican? And since he wrote the book in 2000, uh, con uh, condemning the illegal bombing of uh, the former Yugoslavia, uh, what is his, his opinion about the fact that if Saddam was left alone and uh, the, the sanctions were removed, he would have eventually possessed nuclear weapons, which would have been a danger to the world. So it was better to take him out now. And also, does he feel the NSA is tapping his phone? Thank you. It's pure speculation about whether Saddam Hussein would have had nuclear weapons if we left him alone. But even more important, there was no reason to, to be frightened by that, any more than being frightened by Pakistan having such weapons, or India, or England, or France, or Israel, or the U.S., or China. I mean, wh why do we single out uh, Saddam Hussein and Iraq f for being this nuclear threat? The world is full of such th uh, possible threats, but I wouldn't single him out. And I think your first question had to do with my party affiliation. I'm, I'm neither a Democrat or a Republican. I'm independent of, of both parties. And when it comes to foreign policy, I must emphasize this. In my mind, there is absolutely no distinction whatsoever between the two major parties when it comes to foreign policy. Our guest does have a website. It is killinghope.org. Uh, why the website address of Killing Hope? That's the name of my uh, f main book. Uh, the full title is um, Killing Hope, U.S. Military and CIA Interventions Since World War II. And what will people find on your website? They'll find... Uh, a, a description and, and chapters from each of my books uh, with links to each of them. Uh, William Bloom is our guest for the remainder of our time. Orchard Park, New York. Good morning. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Orchard Park. Orchard but, Park. Uh, very close. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bloom, uh, uh, you're a breath of fresh air. Let me ask a little different type of question. Uh, we all know that the Bush administration uh, was uh, four square uh, in a full court press to invade Iraq. But let me ask you, sir, why the American media seem to be a cheerleader? For example, as you know, 60 percent, over 60 percent of the American people in a poll, in an accurate poll, fully believed that Saddam Hussein was involved in 9-11. Now, they all didn't wake up and feel that. Uh, it was the American media, including your own host here this morning, that allowed call after call after call saying because of 9-11, we must invade Iraq. You see the slippery connection that's been made? And I don't recall anybody on C-SPAN or the media saying forcefully, there is no connection. Your comment, sir. 
Yeah, I think the figure you give of 60% uh, may have been the case uh, shortly after we invaded Iraq, but I think now it's down to, uh, to, to 20% or something. I mean, it, it's so outlandish a belief to hold in, in, in the absence of any evidence uh, that I'm, I'm surprised it's even 20%. Houston, Texas. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Bloom uh, where he was born and a brief background on his upbringing and education and how he became such an expert on this field. Expert on what? Expert in your field and oh, I'm assuming oh. foreign policy. I was born in New York City in Brooklyn and I went to City College of New York and uh, in the 1960s I was working at the State Department as a um, computer systems analyst and programmer but my ambition at the time was to become a foreign service officer. I was a good, loyal anti-communist and I wanted to join the cause. But then a thing called Vietnam came along and that changed my mind completely and my life. How do you uh, document the sources in your book? Well, the, the, the book is, is very well documented. All the sources are, are listed. And if you look through the back uh, uh, section, you'll see that most of the, my sources are from the mass media. Uh, the Washington Post and New York Times are, are all over the place, and plus books by former presidents and former uh, diplomats. The previous caller had asked about the media's role in reporting this. What's your take on that? Well, the media has changed along with the American public, or maybe vice versa. I mean, uh, uh, the, the basis of the war is still not questioned as much as I would like it to be, but it's improved a lot. I mean, the past couple of years, I've noticed the press uh, asking much tougher questions of, of, of the president. And when he gives them a slippery answer, they, they repeat the question and, and they, they were more insistent. And I think that's a very good uh, change. East Albany, Georgia. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I guess the boy from Texas uh, didn't, uh, his hunch didn't play out. Uh, he was trying to insinuate that maybe you weren't a, uh, a a native-born citizen, uh, Mr. Bloom. But I, I, I love New York, and I'm I'm glad you're from New York. And New York took the brunt of this uh, always 9/11 excuse that they use. But uh, speaking of excuses, if you were riding a transportation public transportation bus and uh, it, the driver uh, had a bad wreck and hurt everybody on the bus, who would you blame? The driver who was driving it last week, or the driver who caused the wreck? And that's what they're doing. They're blaming the Clinton administration for the uh, attack on uh, September 11th. And they always say that, well, we haven't been attacked since September 11th. And I ask, uh, what about this mailing of anthrax that uh, all they used was simple postage yeah. stamps to shut down effectively Washington, D.C.? And yeah. I'm going to quit yakking and uh, listen. It's, it's fallacious to say that we have not been attacked since 9-11. Because of our invasions and occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, American targets have been, uh, have been hit scores of times all over the Middle East, uh, uh, South Asia, and even in the Pacific, uh, Pacific area. Dozens and dozens of attacks. So we have not actually made any headway in, our, in, in being uh, safer than we, than we were before. Bella Vista, Arkansas. Good morning. I'm kind of a results-oriented person, and I look at the footprints that the United States has left, where they've been, and I'm just kind of curious. You want to live in North Korea, or you want to live in South Korea? You want to live in Japan, Taiwan, or you want to live in Vietnam and Cambodia, Western Europe or Eastern Europe? Everywhere the United States has been, they have left a footprint of freedom and let the people decide their own country. Now, you have your freedom. Why wouldn't you allow other people to have theirs? Also, a repressive government that you or other people keep saying can't be too repressive if you and Norm Chomsky and others like you can voice your opinion. I, I really don't understand you. My being able to voice my opinion is no excuse for the uh, 60 years of American, American war crimes. I mean, you cannot argue that the U.S. has the right to uh, bomb people in, into oblivion because I have a right to sit here in this studio and say, say a few words. It doesn't follow at all. And as far as us leaving footprints, in Af to name one example of many I can give, in Afghanistan, 
the U.S. in the 1980s overthrew a secular government there, which was giving full rights to women and other, and other civil liberties. We overthrew that government, which led directly to the ta Taliban taking power. So we, ha we have no, that's, that's a, one example of the kind of footprint w we have left all over. And I can give many examples of the same kind of uh, fallacy in your thinking. For William Bloom, Las Vegas. Hi, how are you doing today? Uh, yeah, what I uh, that's a good, what that gentleman just uh, said that uh, about you speaking and Norm Chomsky. The problem is you don't get the platform that the others get, so you re rarely get heard. The only reason you're getting heard today is because of the incident that happened. And um, I was just wondering in the, uh, about Iran because we're talking about the past, but we have something impending in the future. And about uh, well, not many people know about the Senate passing these many nukes, these nuclear. Uh, and there, the, a lot of people are saying that they're going to be using those because the Senate passed saying that's okay to use, and they plan to use them in conjunction with uh, uh, Israel and Turkey in a plan to uh, uh, hit Iraq. So nuclear so-called nuclear thing. I wonder if uh, you could comment on that, if you know about it. Well, f for us to uh, invade or bomb Iran would be just as much of a violation of international, uh, international law as our invasion and bombing of uh, Iraq. Uh, I suspect what might happen is not so much a, an inv a land invasion, because we don't have the armed forces for that anymore, uh, but we will bomb them, I think, uh, with or without the help of Israel. Uh, and that uh, I'm, I'm uh, very much opposed to. Uh, Iran has as much right to nuclear weapons as other nations do. I, I would like to see all nations uh, not have such weapons. But uh, as long as some have it, and Iran is surrounded by nations which have those weapons, you know, you, you can't blame them for wanting to have them. Cockeysville, Maryland. Yes, hello? Go ahead. Yes, well, I just wanted to say, um, first of all, I think it's unfortunate that um, you've given this man this format today. Um, I guess you know, next we'll, we can give Osama bin Laden the format to, to defend his, uh, his writings and maybe his tapes. But I just wanted to ask you, sir, um, do you realize that in this country, which, you know, you, you say it's just the foreign policy that you dislike, but we all know that that essentially means that you uh, are opposed to the country and the, and the things that it stands for as far as, as freedoms and liberties. Do you realize that in this country where you've, you've written this book and you, you're making the money that I assume you're going to make off it with all the sales uh, across the Middle East that you're going to get. Uh, if you did this in, in one of those countries, you, you would not uh, be allowed to live. They would, they would cut your head off or something or, or throw you in jail. So just wanted to make sure that you uh, were, were aware of that, and, and isn't that a little hypocritical of you? I just replied to that question a few minutes ago. I mean, if, if the caller is implying that uh, because I can sit here and say what I'm saying, that therefore it's okay, it's humanitarian and legal for the U.S. to go around the world dropping napalm and, and, and missiles and um, white phosphorus and all kinds of other horrible weapons. It's okay then? Is, is that what he means to say? How do you stand to make financially on this book, uh, because? I have no idea. The, the, the figures we hear about f on Amazon are not sales figures. Those are ranking figures. And I have, uh, I have no idea uh, how that uh, is arrived at. And f for all I know, if 50 people call Amazon on the same day about the same book, the, r the, the ranking of that book will shoot all the way up. So I, I, have, I have no expectation of making much money out of this. And there certainly wasn't any motivation for my uh, doing it. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yes, sir. How are you, Mr. Bloom? Fine, thank you. Uh, I'm an independent, so I, I basically don't choose one side or another. But I do do a little reading, and it said that, uh, tell me if you agree with this or not, how close is the United States to becoming what would be considered an empire versus a, a, a secular state, let's say? And is it not true we have 800 bases in 130 countries, like that last guy was talking, that about we free, gave freedom to Korea, we gave freedom, but we leave bases back there to keep our country involved. So another question I have, if I can, I just want to get through these real fast. Uh, if our country went into Iraq and Iraq decides to become a Shiite uh, religion, just uh, run their country that way, 
as they do in Iran, well, we can still consider it a democracy that we were in over there. Would it be considered something we have to change and control because a new leader might come in, and now that leader would be the one we'd have to take out, as we've done in other countries. And uh, if you could answer some of those, uh, I would appreciate that. Yeah, it would be very ironic indeed if uh, Iraq uh, became uh, any kind of Islamic state, because under under uh, Saddam Hussein, whom I, I is not I'm not a fan of his, under him there was there was full religious freedom, uh, Jews and Christians uh, were were safe there, and not now though, uh, so that would that would be very ironic. Springfield, Missouri. Yes, my question for you, Mr. Bloom, is that. Um, you stated that um, uh, you're independent and all that. I mean, I have a couple of questions. One, do you feel like you're a true American? I have no idea what you mean by, by a true American. Well, I mean, you're not standing, you know, we have uh, soldiers over in Iraq and Afghanistan and fighting, putting their lives on the line. <clears throat> but you want to sit here and give, you know, basis to the terrorists and the ones over there that are attacking us. I support, I support our armed forces by calling for, for, for them to be sent home immediately and s before they lose an arm or a leg or, or their eyesight. That's, that's how I support them. Do you have a follow-up question, caller? Some of your comments may have some basis to it, but, you know, until... And when you just made a statement that Iran has a right to have nuclear weapons like any other state after their president has made the comments that he's made recently about wiping out Israel off the face of the earth. I mean, what do you feel about that? Every leader in the Middle East uh, is obliged at, at some point or another to make very tough statements concerning Israel. That's p part of being accepted as legitimate. I don't place much faith, faith in, in those statements. I don't, uh, I think that's, that's a, an excuse used to condemn uh, the, the uh, leader of Iran. I mean, although I'm not any fan of his, I assure you. Long Branch, New Jersey. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Bloom. Thank you for your intelligence and your clarity. And I need to apologize for all the stupid white men that you're going to hear from for the rest of the morning. But um, I understand that there were plans, uh, war plans on Bush's desk long before September 11th for Afghanistan and Iraq. And can you speak to, to, you know, about that with some more clarity? Because I'd like to understand that a little more. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, well, there's evidence, uh, certainly, that the, some of the neocons who, who surround Bush um, were, uh, were pushing for an invasion of Iraq uh, as early as 1998, I think. Uh, that's, that's, that's well documented. There's, there's a letter signed by all of them, all the big names, uh, Wilford Woods and Pearl and all the others. Uh, and this letter was sent to... Uh, Clinton and to uh, other other leaders uh, calling for an invasion uh, on Iraq in 1998, th that early. William Bloom, our guest, Evanston, Illinois. Mr. Bloom, um, thanks for being in today. Um, I am calling on the Republican line, but um, I have a, a quick question and then an equally quick follow-up, if I may. Uh, the question being, do you think that uh, President Bush and his actions in Iraq uh, would qualify him to be classified as a war criminal? Yes, I do. The, the invasion of Iraq, t with, well, without any provocation at all, without any invasion of us by Iraq, that is so. That is what the, the UN, uh, excuse me, the um, the Nuremberg Tribunal called the uh, the the ultimate crime, a, a war of aggression, is what they called it, and that's what this is, a war of aggression. Uh, it, it, if if we we have a world where any any, any nation can invade any other nation because they don't like their leader or, or for any other reason like that. What, what kind of world would it be? Well, in regards to that, then, um, and, and I'm, I really am interested in picking up a copy of your book because it is an anthology of, of 60 years of this type of behavior. Um, how would you, or what, I guess the question I have is because I'm having difficulty finding this information. What is the total death toll of, that occurred in Iraq due to American bombing? and uh, military as well as civilian that occurred during the eight years of the Clinton administration? Oh, um, I don't know all the figures, but there was this one famous figure. Uh, the, the UN uh, determined that the, the embargo upon Iraq had caused the deaths of about 500,000 children. Uh, so, so to that figure, you have to add the adult deaths uh, caused by the embargo. 
Uh, and that's independent uh, of the bombing and, and what have you. Uh, that's simply the embargo. So it's quite a huge number we're talking about. Mansfield, Texas, good morning. Good morning. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. Um, I'm just simply uh, uh, amazed at how short-sighted uh, we as a country uh, has become. Uh, I'll use the analogy that the earlier caller used with regard to footprints and his insistence that wherever we stepped, we have left uh, freedom and democracy in its wake. But if we take a critical objective look at wherever we've been, we've propped up these regimes that, uh, repressive regimes, I would call them, and uh, I think, uh, to borrow an old phrase, the chickens have just come home to roost. Yeah. Now, George Bush has said they hate us because of freedom. We're extending freedom and democracy, and people are making a choice. They're making a choice that for years, centuries, that they have been exploited, and uh, there's one other point I'd like to make. We talked about earlier about the failings of the fourth estate, the press. I think they defer to not wanting to give uh, aid and comfort and support the president in his endeavor to uh, fight the actual perpetrators of the 9-11. Mr. Bloom. Okay, one point I'll comment about the, the idea that, that we leave, uh, our, our foreign policy leaves freedom in its wake. It would be very difficult to name any dictatorship, uh, any brutal dictatorship of the second half of the 20th century, which was not supported by, by U.S. foreign policy. And more than just supported, these men were put into power and kept in power. That is the record, and I, I, I touch upon that in, in my books. Uh, we, 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 ha we have been the champion of dictatorships much more than the champion of any kind of freedom or democracy. Just a few more minutes with our guests. We have this email. Um, it says, the stated goal of radical Islamic fundamental fundamentalism is to assimilate or destroy all non-Islam infidel peoples. How would your organization or movement prevent this from happening if we allow them to continue to spread across the world? As I mentioned, we are encouraging the spread of uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism and, and, and so-called terrorism um, by our foreign policy. We, we are not doing anything to, to stop that spread uh, with, our, with our policies. It's just, just the opposite. New York City. Uh, good morning. Mr. Blum? Yes. Okay. Um, I seem to um, get the impression that you are somewhat naive in terms of foreign policy. It, we are in competition in, in the global um, need for, you know, resources. And we have, um, you know, we've had the, the Russians, um, you know, in, in the same field, in the same geopolitical uh, states that, that we've been trying to attain control. And I'm just wonder how you perceive um, you know, the competition for natural resources in terms of uh, your, uh, your, your, your thinking and, and, and how, whether or not we should be conducting our foreign policy unilaterally without any regard to what other people are trying to do to get these resources. And I, I believe you're very altruistic, and I can appreciate that, but I'm just, I just don't understand how the United States secures oil resources and other natural resources that we need before we invaded Iraq, we had no problem in, in getting oil. Every country in, in the Middle East was selling us oil. There, there, was, there was no barrier to us buying oil. We didn't have to invade them f for that uh, kind of, of um, resource. So I'm not sure what, what you're speaking of. And I'm, you're speaking of, um, of, of, of a point of view, which I'm, I'm not dealing with anyhow at the moment. I'm approaching our foreign policy from a rather moral point of view, you can call that naive if you want, but I'm just appalled at the harm and suffering that our, our foreign policy has caused for the past 60 years. And th that's where I'm coming from. Knoxville, tell last call. Good morning. Mr. Bloom, can you, can you tell us why, um, 
we bombed Iraq instead of Saudi Arabia, uh, seeing that that was where most of the hijackers uh, per, uh, supposedly come from? Well, that shows that our, our bombing and invasion of Iraq had no connection at all to 9-11. Um, and, uh, and it certainly had no connection to freedom or democracy because Saudi Arabia is not, is not exactly a, a free society. So that, that, that points out two of the flaws in, in, in the arguments put forth by the White House. Again, here is the book Rogue State. Our author is William Bloom. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you very much. Coming up on the Washington Journal tomorrow, we'll be joined by Representative Chris Shays and Stephen Moore as we uh, host a roundtable discussion about the Republican Party. We will do a same type of discussion about the Democratic Party with Ed Kilgore of the Democratic Leadership Council and Katrina Vanden Heuvel of uh, The Nation. We will finish our program tomorrow with Afif Safiya, the PLO ambassador to the United States, to discuss the Hamas elections and the future of Hamas in, Palis uh, in Palestinian politics. And uh, again, uh, we are going to go now to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the Challenger Remembrance Service. Uh,